apologies the Buddha gave for them, as we've said in previous sessions, but they're worth reviewing, was uh, kamachanda, or sensual lust, is akin to being in debt, or a bowl of water mixed with color so that one could not see one's face, and sacred words long known to one would be unclear. Just to note what that means, the idea of going into debt whenever we seek outside ourselves for gratification. It's like we give a piece of our hearts to the world and go into debt immediately. And then when those things and objects of the senses fade and change, we seek new stimulus. And it's like taking out a new debt at higher interest to pay off the old, and it never ends. The second hindrance the Buddha termed vayapada, or uh, ill will, and he compared it to sickness so that one would not enjoy one's meals and one would, one's body would be weak. Or a bowl of water heated over flame so that it bubbled and one's reflection would not be clear and sacred words long known to one would be obscure. And this idea of being sick, whereas one can put a lot of debt on one's visa card and have a good time doing it, and sensual desire feels good when you're in it, anger does not. Anger is painful, and it's a sickness. Also, one who is sick, there's an, uh, an ugliness to the body when it is breaking out in pox or something. And uh, anger is an ugly state. The third hindrance the Buddha termed tinamita, or sloth and torpor. And he compared it to being in a dungeon, dark, or a bowl of water covered in algae and water plants so that one could not see one's face and sacred words long known to one would not be clear. And I think the resonance of the analogy of sleepiness and drowsiness being uh, resi residing in a dark and dingy dungeon doesn't need so much explanation, actually. The fourth hindrance the Buddha termed uh, uttachakukucha, or restlessness and remorse, or anxiety and remorse, thinking anxiously about the future, or thinking with remorse about the past. And he compared it to being enslaved, uh, forced to do and go where one did not wish, and not able to uh, follow one's own uh, will, or to a bowl of water ruffled by the wind so that one could not see one's reflection in sacred words long known to one would remain obscure. And this analogy of restlessness being a master constantly making us move and go here and there and not able to ever rest or just be uh, subject to our own will is exactly the experience of restlessness and remorse. And the fifth hindrance, which is the one we're on today, is that of vicha kicha or skeptical doubt or uncertainty, which the Buddha compared to traveling in a caravan through bandit-infested wilderness, or to a bowl of water mixed muddied set in a dark place, so that one could not see one's face, and sacred words long known to one would not be clear. And freedom from all these, unification of mind and calm, he compared to freedom from debt, freedom from sickness, freedom from a dungeon, freedom from slavery, safe passage, or a bowl of water, clear, limpid, so that one could see one's face and sacred texts, even just learned, would be clear. So I think we'd all like that. The doubt, Vichy Gicha, is one of the most insidious of all of them, and as moderns, it's the one that hamstrings us the most. When sensual desire or anger, 
the drowsiness or restlessness come up in meditation, we know it's a hindrance, but doubt, skeptical doubt, we can buy into as part, a valid part of the meditation, thinking this teacher said to do this, this other teacher said to do this, and we run in circles around uh, chasing our own tail for a whole session. It can seem like a valid use of a sit. And it's important to distinguish, this isn't uh, doubt in the sense of uh, the opposite of dogma. In Zen, they have a saying, small doubt, small enlightenment, big doubt, big enlightenment. So a methodical and careful investigation of a dogma is a completely valid thing. And in Buddhism, faith is an article of uh, the heart or a part of the heart constrained and guided by wisdom. One takes on only as much faith uh, initially or competence or needs to uh, as a scientist would testing a hypothesis. Does this path lead to lessening of suffering, growth in wholesome qualities? And we put it to the test. And the beauty is that the form of meditation and life give us a field of experimentation. We can test our faith. So at the very basis, uh, or the most basic, faith can be, or confidence, that much. Buddhism does not have a blind faith. But this doubt, the skeptical doubt, is the type that goes nowhere. Doubt is, there's no way through, past doubt through doubt. Not this kind anyways. And I think we all know that sensation of moving this way and that, proliferating in a way that's not useful and never solves the problem. And uh, in one sutta, the Ahara Sutta, the Buddha gives the cure for doubt as one knows bright states and dark states, states connected with light and with darkness, coarse and refined, skillful and unskillful. And what I take this to mean is that when we are caught in doubt, going to the object of the doubt never solves it, but looking at the state of mind itself does. So instead of looking at the object of attention, can we look instead of the state of mind as dark or light, bright or dark, skillful or unskillful, coarse or refined? And if we see that sensation of neurotic, trembling, sort of chewing on an old bone we've chewed on a thousand times before, we know it as doubt. And just naming it is enough often for it to soften. This is knowing dark and bright states in a way that hamstrings doubt. There's different kinds of doubt in this teaching. But perhaps one of the most debilitating is doubt in ourselves. And this is so common in moderns. Thinking we're not good enough, maybe the Buddha could attain enlightenment and certain people have found some transcendence, but not us with our neuroses and our problems and our histories. And in such cases, it's really worth looking at what disciples came into view through the suttas in the time of the Buddha. You had Angulimala, who was a, a serial killer and attained enlightenment. You had princes who killed their fathers and came and repented and entered the path. The Buddha received everyone with equanimity and compassion, and no one is beyond redemption. Moreover, one thing you find is that those who've encountered deeply and been impacted by the first noble truth, uh, knowledge of suffering, often enter and move into the other three noble truths, letting go of craving, realizing peace, and developing the path with a depth and a sincerity commensurate with their encounter with suffering. And you see this with, for example, um, addicts. We've uh, 
you know, there's many who in this group who've been part of AA or Refuge Recovery, the Buddhist version of AA. And one thing you notice about people who've been through that path of addiction and uh, a low point is that they don't accessorize with the practice. There's a sincerity and a rawness of compassion which is rare and brilliant. And ironically, the path to majesty of spirit is through this humbling of the ego. And suffering, if held with right view, can do that. So even if we've been through uh, trauma, even if we've messed up in the past, the not only does that not a barrier to our awakening, but it can be stepping stone towards it and towards greater compassion in the heart. Suffering breaks us open, and that's what reveals uh, a genuine point of contact with the world. It's, why the, it's one of the reasons why the first noble truth was raised up by the Buddha, because suffering is what uh, unites us. Um, in, in Thailand, they have a common phrase where they say, all those around you are here brothers and sisters in birth, aging, and death. So I think one useful way to uh, deal with doubt is to use different upaya or skillful means. And what we can look at these, uh, how we can look at these today maybe is through the framework of the Four Noble Truths. So looking and feeling suffering, dukkha, letting go of its cause, craving, realizing peace, uh, cessation, and developing the path, the Noble Eightfold Path. And so using this framework or the sort of rough sketch which these Four Noble Truths provide for this more broad picture, um, we can begin with the First Noble Truth, suffering. Often uh, the doubts we have it are around you know, what to do in a situation or how to proceed with uh, life. And one really useful metric is just what's bringing up suffering. It can be that simple. I mentioned this last session, but if one has doubt about a certain moral decision, uh, you know, using your friend's Netflix account or parking in a reserved spot, if you're constantly debating whether it's right or not, if you're constantly uneasy about it, that's dukkha. That's a wavering uh, point of stress. And the path is to give that up. So if there's doubt about doing or giving up something, and one knows that one could come to a place of clarity and calm by giving it up, then one gives it up. Because what you're doing is you're seeing suffering and letting it go. Similarly, when people encounter the Dhamma, often there's a real, we fall in love with it and want to pour our whole hearts into it. And often then you read Buddhist texts and the Buddha's admonishing people to, you know, monks to kind of go off alone and renounce. And this is an important, uh, you know, admonition to take seriously. And yet, as moderns, many of us are already self-flagellating, neurotic people, uh, you know, what we often need is a sense of being guided by warmth, normalcy, and flourishing. And dukkha in its forms can be described as the opposite of all three of those. So instead of warmth, normalcy, and flourishing, is there a sense of coldness pulling back from people in a way that feels uh, emotionally violent? Is there a sense of withering, of a steady drying up of the heart? Is there a sense not of normalcy, but of kind of contorting oneself? And these are, this is so common, and it's almost inevitable. We fall in love with the path, and so we uh, jump right in. But if we sense dukkha manifesting through our practice in those forms of contortion, withering, coldness, take note, adjust, let go. Warmth, flourishing, normalcy, that's what we want. That's what we need to aim for. And this is seeing dukkha and letting it go. Another really important uh, point is some people, you know, recently were talking about their jobs, wondering if they were ethical or not, if it was right livelihood. The companies they were part of, you know, were involved with not perfect organizations. And it's important to acknowledge we live in the modern world. Uh, every organization is part of 
you know, distasteful acts almost. Um, you know, if we pay taxes, we're paying into certain um, actions which maybe we don't approve of. So there's something to be acknowledged there. Um, but at the same time, uh, it is important to take note of the broadening scope of our moral horizon. And one really good way to see that is seeing dukkha manifest in the body when we do something that isn't integrated with our vision and intuitive feeling of who we want to be. Um, so there's this real sense of weakening. If going to work every day and doing a certain action or saying a certain, you know, slightly dishonest thing makes you feel weak inside, literally your body disintegrating, that's worth noting. That's seeing dukkha and letting it go. And you can resolve doubt by seeing the body's reaction to that, things like that. There's a famous uh, priest, uh, Zen priest in Japan, who, when he was deciding whether to get rid of an object, he would hold it to his chest, and if his body felt weak, he would know it wasn't something he needed, and so he'd give it up. If it sparked joy, he would keep it. And often it's just enough to notice when we're stuck in some suffering debate, this is dukkha, suffering. Just notice that, how painful it is to be gnawing on that same bone. The second noble truth, craving, being the cause of suffering. So there's something very useful here also in terms of looking at doubt, in that often the question of what will make me happiest, what's you know best for me, it's an arithmetic that never ends. Our own self-aggrandizing uh, happiness it's just something we love to kind of gnaw on and play over, and the doubt never ends around it. And there's days when, you know, I think it'd be really nice to have dinner and go see a movie. So even as a monk, you know, asking what's the, you know, is it right for me to remain a monk or not? I, I've never had serious doubts about that, but that arithmetic can come into play, like what's best for me? And that's based on craving. And it's important to realize that one of the most basic changes in orientation as practitioners is one from feeding off the world to giving to the world. And so often a question with a doubt invoking answer based on what's ha best for me will dissolve and become clear when the question becomes, what can I do for the sake of the Dhamma? How can I best serve the world? Because in terms of say remaining in robes for me personally, that question has always been much clearer and I think, you know, not everyone will ordain as a monastic, that's fine. But what I'm saying is that question of what can I give, what is best, uh, how can I best serve, that's a clear, often that's a very clear answer and it'll ring out. The next thing is that often we aim for perfection in all these external things in our world. We crave uh, perfection. And there's a teacher in Sri Lanka who said that if Buddhism could be summarized in two words, it would be Yava Deva, only for the sake of. All these things, our marriage, our job, our food, our requisites, our life, is only for the sake of the practice, awakening, clarifying, and purifying the heart so that we are better servants of the world. And this is such a relief because finding the perfect sp spouse, the perfect career, the perfect living situation, the perfect body will never happen in samsara. It's always falling apart around us. But is the marriage good enough for practice? Is our job good enough? Is our living situation good enough for the sake of the path? You know, when the Buddhists spoke about the path as a raft, we used to uh, swim from this side of the flood to the other, to Nibbana. We always think of this kind of like Tom Sawyer-ish, like well put together raft, but what the Buddha was talking about is you bind up a bunch of sticks and twigs and you just put it on your chest and then you paddle with your hands and kick with your feet. It's not a Tom Sawyer raft. Most of us don't have Tom Sawyer rafts. What we have is a bunch of sticks and our histories and our brokenness and our imperfect relationships and jobs and that's what we bind together and it's good enough because part of its power is its brokenness. So 
that can help. Like when you're thinking about is this situation good enough? Is this relationship perfect? Just is it good enough? Is it good enough for the path? That's the second noble truth of craving, or we can tie it to that for this sake of this framework. The third noble truth, cessation or peace, uh, cessation of suffering or peace. The reason the four noble truths are ordered as they are is it's modeled off of Ayurvedic medicine, where first you have the uh, diagnosis, suffering, the cause, um, then you have the cure, and then the prognosis of the path. But another interesting way to look at the order is that the path, the fourth noble truth, only becomes clear when you've in first encountered the third of peace. Rarely from a point and state of agitated mind does clarity emerge. Often you have to wait until things get calm and make your decision from there, from that place. So this is just good. When the mind's agitated, don't try to make a decision from that place. Wait until things have calmed and then decide. And actually a very useful, skillful means in this respect is if you're having trouble deciding on something, ask yourself the question right when you wake up. And often you'll have access to a deeper, calmer part of yourself that will answer very clearly and very quickly. And the other point is that this third noble truth of peace, cessation, to recognize that there are points in our lives where we see clearly, where we step into a footstep, a footprint that was made for us, where we know very clearly what is right and worthy and what is trivial. And you, what we need to do is you steer your life from those points. You take those landmarks and you put a flag in them. And there's a specific... Uh, paramita, spiritual perfection, that we utilize in Buddhism quite a lot called aditana, determination. So often when you come to one of those places of peace and clarity of vision, you make a determination from there. Like, because you know that the next day maybe you're going to want to turn back on, I don't know, the Netflix series or whatever. So in that moment of clarity, can you say, I'm just going to stop drinking and I'm going to make this aditana now? Um, and once again, I've spoken about the idea of if you need some help, uh, go write a check to your political, rival political party, give it to a friend, and say that if you break your aditana, they should mail it, something like that. And so, uh, but steer your life by those points of clarity. And there is a place for oath and determination. The fourth noble truth of the path. This is the broadest of all. And in the Four Noble Truths, this is the Eightfold Path, but here we'll utilize it as a broad indicator of all the sort of skillful things we can do um, on the path. And so one skillful means the Buddha recollected is, or used and recommended is recollection of death. Because in light of death and realizing the fragility and uncertainty of our lives, Often things become very clear. What's trivial and non-trivial become very lucidly clear. And the fact that your partner didn't wash the dishes like you wanted them to becomes significantly less important. And meditating every day becomes significantly more important. So often when uh, people would come to the monastery, unsure about ordaining or not, my teacher Ajahnan would tell them to just begin recollecting death every day. And that will clarify in your heart what is trivial and non-trivial in your life. The other point of the path is recognizing that it's very helpful to have a form. The props are important because we forget too easily where we should orient our hearts and our lives, and the world is not helping us often. So yes, coming together is beautiful. But what people don't realize is the Buddha laid down a fairly cohesive and powerful form for laity. It's called the Upasaka form. And what it means, and this is just takes a lot of the constant negotiation and doubt out of the whole picture, is you hold the five precepts constantly. And um, recommended in this form is the idea of once a week, take uh, 
formally it was the eight precepts recommended, but what it means is basically, or how you can hold it, is just take one day a week to dedicate more to practice. Avoid entertainment for that day. Turn off your phone for at least part of the day, the afternoon. Um, sleep on the ground if you want, or on sort of a mat uh, on the ground um, instead of your usual bed. It sounds silly, but it's really helpful to recollect that that day is for meditation and you're not indulging in sleep. Don't know how that'll go over with a spouse. You'll have to, you know, see. But there's that. And uh, just the idea of really uh, stepping into monasteries every now and again when you're able. Go visit Abayagiri. Go visit, uh, in California, go visit Servasti Abbey on the east side of the state. And that much structure really helps because, oh, and a daily meditation practice, 20 minutes a day at least, that's basic hygiene for practitioners. So, and if you can get up to 45 minutes a day, there's generally a sea change that will happen in the heart, meditating 45 minutes a day, and then another at an hour and a half a day, 45 minutes in the evening, 45 minutes in the morning, something like that. So can you steer towards that? And that takes a lot of the guesswork out of a life because it gives you a structure that you accommodate and the rest of your life will arrange around that and things will become much clearer. And finally, there's just the fact that as long as we are our own refuges in the sense of having no guiding star, it's hard not to doubt and to wonder about the proper course of a life. And this is why taking refuge in our potential for awakening is significant. And you can model that explicitly when we bow to the Buddha image, when we uh, pay homage to the triple gem at the beginning of the talk. It's not some superstitious, you know, um, supplication to some deity. It's embodying in an act, this recollection of what we are, our potential is. The Buddha is the quality of knowing and the potential, sorry, the potential for awakening for a human being. The Dhamma is truth and the path. The Sangha is what happens when that potential for awakening knows truth and manifests in a human being. So can you recollect that and really take refuge and a life when aligned in such a way becomes a lot simpler. Ajahn Chah said that when we don't understand death, life becomes very confusing. And I would say the same applies to when we don't understand our true purpose, which is awakening. What else would it be? You know, a comfortable middle class life, <laughs> you know. And not that we can't use a comfortable middle class life for awakening, but it's all for the sake of. So this is doubt spoken about on a broader landscape, coming to settledness. And I would just say that it is worth briefly speaking to what that means in meditation, just that we really can find ourselves wound, winding in circles around certain uh, questions or neuroses or which technique to use. And it's very good to remember that the Buddha emphasized again and again mindfulness of breathing as the quote-unquote abode of the Tathagata, his home. It's such a stable practice, good for almost everyone. So if you're feeling, uh, and in the Anapanasati Sutta, which is the 16 steps of breath meditation outlined by the Buddha, there's a lot of steps in there. It can get very doubtful, but it's good just to come back to the first four, which are all about just coming into the body, following the breath, and being aware of the whole body. So whenever you're spinning off in meditation, like what's right, what should I do, you're never going to solve that by thinking about it. So just come back home. And home is always this body feeling the breathing and being the breathing in and out, tracking it. And then once you've come, identified doubt, return to the breathing, which is the antidote given to doubt uh, in the commentaries. Then from there, once things have calmed, you can decide how your meditation should progress. And that's 
much easier to do when things have calmed down. And finally, it's very useful to come together regularly, once a week or more often if you can, and just be with others who understand this path, to speak about your practice, and to feel supported in uh, a direction and a unification of mind and purpose in life, which is rare in the world. And this is when all the hindrances fade, the quality which emerges, one of them is called ekagata, which means unification of mind. It's all parts of ourselves in harmony. And this can apply to a meditation, but it can also apply to a life where we feel like we're finally aligned with our purpose, with our deaths, and with the depth of note and profundity of the Dhamma which we have been given and which we have a duty to carry forward with integrity and care. So best of luck. Sadhu, 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 Anumodami. So we have a, a chance for conversation and questions. If people have them, raise your hand and we'll run mindfully fast walk the mic over to you. If you're on Zoom, raise your electronic hand and we can call on you and unmute you. And uh, if you're on YouTube, um, you can type your question in the chat as well. And I think we actually have someone on Zoom. Is that the case? Please, Aaron, I think Thanks. we can hear you. Good morning, Ajahn. It's uh, good to see and hear you again. Um, could you say something about the Bawa Tanha and We Bawa Tanha? Good question. And, and you, you covered the Kama Tanha, but the, the becoming and the getting rid of Tanha. Mm. And just any specific context or just in general? Yeah, in general, what uh, what is the becoming is uh, in in your uh, in your knowing about it, and what is the the getting rid of the we mm. Thank you. So there are uh, the second noble truth is craving is the source of suffering, and the craving the word for it is tanha, which means thirst. Um, it's this constant sense of, sense of thirst. And the three sorts of craving the Buddha identifies are kama tanha, which is craving for sensuality. Um, sort of, uh, it, it's feeding off of this sort of buying into uh, and fantasizing about sense pleasures. Then there's bhava tanha, which is craving for becoming. And then vibhava tanha, which is craving to not become or for annihilation. And I think bhava tanha is one of the most uh, powerful forces uh, in that this craving to become, you can really feel it manifest in the uh, motion of the heart towards, um, well, becoming something. And... Um, it manifests in ways that you wouldn't always expect. Um, for example, like it's it's fairly easy to see how when you get a uh, you know a job offer or um, something like that, like this whole machinery gets set in motion where you're beginning to think about it and play into it. Um, often, you know, uh, when a relationship gets going, I mean, there is kama tanha sensuality craving in there. But often a lot of it's, you know, wanting to be someone who's loved, uh, wanting to be affirmed as this kind of person, worthy. Um, and the thing is that same kind of desire to become can also uh, really be manifest in um, something like self-righteous anger, where maybe there's vibhava tanha craving to push away or uh, shut out something we don't like. But often there's also this huge, um, you know, desire to be the righteous one too. It's all mixed together. And 
I think Baba Tanha, it's, it's very useful to kind of see that self manifesting and its, uh, its feel and its uh, seductiveness. One thing to recognize is that these cravings are so deep in us that they do manifest on the path. You know, usually when you encounter, say, the spiritual path and begin to meditate, there's a lot of um, desire to be known as a meditator, to dive, you know, all the way in, to let others know. Um, often, if I'm sure people have had this experience where you have a pleasant meditation and, you know, suddenly you're, you really want to plant your flag in that good meditation and, and, you know, let people know subtly about what you experienced. And it's just, just recognize it, see the tanha manifesting and let go. It's okay. It's, it's there. Um, and also to say that, uh, you know, in Vibhava Tanha is usually the craving not to become. So it's this desire for annihilation, and it can manifest as something like a suicidal ideation, but it can also manifest in quite interesting ways. For example, the urge to binge often isn't Kama Tanha, sensuality. It's a desire, desire to annihilate ourselves, to annihilate all sensation. And that's, it's interesting to see these two threads playing out. Um, and finally, to see if either one manifests in, as it manifests in practice. And just when it comes up to notice that kind of flush of becoming energy and to let it go and see the suffering. Um, so maybe that's what I could say for now. It's a really Thank good question. You. Vikram. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, um, Joey, um, wait for the mic, maybe. And if people could say their names, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Joey. Um, uh, thank you, Arjan, for this talk. Um, I was curious if you have any recommendations for um, an active practice for death contemplation. Yeah, so this is the one that comes across as morbid and, you know, a lot of meditation circles, but it's it's really helpful. Um, it can hamstring thought using thought, basically. And my teacher, Ajahn Anand, he couldn't follow breath meditation for the first few years of his monastic life. Um, and maybe I should turn the mic back or, no, don't turn it off. It'll scream at us, but yeah, like that. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so his main meditation object for the first four years of his monastic life was death contemplation. So one thing you can really do is in a meditation, just really recollect how you don't know how long you'll live. Like people die from strokes all the time. You could die in a car accident. You could literally have a stroke in these next few seconds. Um, you know, when the Buddha asked the monks how often they recollected death, the monk he said actually was being heedful was the one who thought, I have this inhale to practice. I have this much time, I have this exhale to practice, this much time. Um, so you can either do a pretty kind of imaginative meditation where you really kind of recollect like all these things that could happen, like you don't know you have any time left really at all beyond this breath. Um, but then it's usual to find a phrase that kind of resonates and that you can keep in mind all the time. So the phrase my teacher used was, uh, life is uncertain, death is certain. Life is uncertain, death is certain. Another one is, I will die. I've used that a lot. <laughs> I will die. Uh, just this moment, just this moment. Um, uh, maranan usati, or maranang, maranang. In, in Pali, that means death. Maranang, maranang. Um, so I find these are hard recollections to keep in mind constantly as a mantra, but they will cut off thinking powerfully in the moments you need them. Like, this is all you have, just this breath just this breath. And if you can really center on that, it's, it's a powerful sword to use. And then, yeah, if, you, if you're having trouble deciding on something to, to bring up death, then, you know, we just, we don't know how long we have at all. So, yeah. Larry, and uh, wonderful meditation. Uh, meta and compassion seem the same. How to distinguish Metta and compassion seem the same, how to distinguish. So for those who don't know, uh, the Brahma Viharas um, are the sort of four flavors of loving kindness, which we talk about. So metta or loving kindness, friendliness kind of, uh, karuna, uh, compassion, 
uh, response to another suffering or how metta responds to another suffering. Uh, mudita, sympathetic joy or gladness, um, how metta responds to another's happiness. And upekka, equanimity, equipoise, um, the sort of bird's eye view where we step back and uh, most Buddhist lists have one representative of wisdom guiding all of them. And upekka, equanimity, is the representative of wisdom in the Brahmadiharas. Metta and compassion, um, I find that, you know, you sort of have to seek out the flavor which feels, uh, which is distinct for each. But I find metta really has this radiating quality of friendliness. My route to compassion and karuna has always really been a lot more individual. It, it, it's more of an individual response. So I'll really have to, you know, metta, you can make may all these beings be happy. Karuna, usually I, compassion, usually I have to think of one person with one issue. And uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi makes this a practice in airports. Is every person that walks past him, he'll think of like one specific thing for them. Like, may that person make it to their gate on time. May that person find, you know, love, have like a, you know, safe flight, something like that. And I find compassion's just a more, calling it a more humble one isn't quite right, but it's, it's just, I, I find there's a sort of, it's more restrained or, or something. It's, it's quieter. You know, it's, it's the sunlight at dusk. So, yeah, I mean, it's not terribly, these all overlap, but there are times where you might be able to find that sense of mudita more, but it's all the same face. In Buddhist cosmology, the Brahma gods, which are, you know, the Brahma viharas, literally mean the abodes of the Brahmas, they're often depicted with four faces. So these are the four faces of one, one being, basically. I actually kind of have a follow-up question to that. My name is Grace. Um, how does it feel differently in your body? Do you have a different experience of metta versus compassion versus the other Brahma Viharas? Mm. This would be a good conversation subject for the coffee social, too. Um, <laughs> my, um, well, first, I think there's something with, uh, metta can be a really seductive thing to radiate out and kind of shoot metta rays at people. And we've talked about this often, but like really often what we need to do is, is come back and um, first of all have, uh, you know, often when we're having a hard time, we'll try to kind of push the metta out and they'll have this radiating quality where he's, you know, especially if we're angry at someone and trying to, to radiate metta, whereas often like what we need in that moment is just compassion for ourselves because it hurts to be angry. And, and that's, what, that's the Brahma Viharas. It doesn't really matter who you're aiming them at. You know, it's the quality of the heart. So for me, karuna is much more in the, in the body often and it's, it's sweeter and it's more listening. It's a little less active. Um, and uh, Ajahn Pasano sort of, this could apply to all the Brahma Viharas. He says like, instead of spreading metta out, shrink people and bring them in um, to your heart. And that kind of keeps the field salient. Uh, and I find that's probably especially true with karuna, compassion. But for me, it just, it, it has a sweeter, sweeter quality. I don't know how to, sort of gentler, sweeter quality. It's humble. Yeah. I don't know. I'll be curious. That is a good question for Q unit, or for the coffee social. <laughs> we have to wrap up in just a second, but one more, Matthew. Greetings, Ajahn. This is Matthew. Um, you had talked about craving or tanha. Um, my question is how to how to distinguish what is craving versus just other variations of desire. Um, my understanding is that the craving is what it, what is the cause of, of suffering and kind of keeps us in this um, cycle of suffering. But um, Buddha has talked about other like variations of desire that um, that seem to happen before the craving, and those uh, wouldn't necessarily, since they're before craving, they're not actually uh, the cause of suffering. So, for example, like lust, um, desire, affection, um, thirst, and passion, um, these seem to be variations of desire 
or craving or, the, or things that lead up to the craving. So how, how may we distinguish uh, when we're in these variations versus when we're actually in the craving? Hmm. I'd have to see, you know, the Buddha used these terms slightly differently depending on the sutta. But, but I think what we have time for and what comes to mind most readily around this is the fact that tanha is a note of unwholesome thirst which we can find in most, in, in, in states to some extent and in many actions running through. The other sort of desire, and, and there is a place, the, the other sort of desire that the Buddha spoke about most often was chanda, um, which means zeal. And in some cases it's used as kama chanda, which is like uh, desire for sensuality, but often it's used in a wholesome context like dhammic zeal. Um, and how I think about distinguishing those for myself is zeal is, uh, it's, it's, it's productive. It's wanting to make things whole and produce and give. Um, and I think that's why it's so healthy on the path, um, whereas tanha is much more feeding and wanting and craving. And so it's not, not a, a helpful thing to have on the path. Um, and I think they roughly align to the, dopamine and serotonin systems. I think zeal is much more dopaminergic, which is like progress towards a meaningful goal is dopamine, which is zeal. Whereas serotonin is much more involved with like consumption and consuming. Uh, a lot of serotonin is produced in the gut. So that's a rough answer, but I, I don't think we have time to do any more. And there's probably way more to say on that. So thank you, Matthew.